Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to jump into the concept of the immune privileged brain. Now it's got a big question mark there because how immune privileged is it? Is it immune privileged? That's all relative questions here and as with all my videos I'll end up saying it's way more complicated than it is but there is some truth to the statement that the brain is somewhat immune privileged. It's, it's immunologically very different to other tissues in the body, right? The average tissue in the body. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And to start off, I've just got this picture of the skin cell here. Um, the skin cell here, and what we can see is in, within the skin, we've got, um, we've got these uh, cytotoxic T cells, we've got adaptive T cells, we've got dendritic cells, we've got macrophages, we've got Langerhang cells, we've got natural killer cells. So th throughout your skin, you have a huge network of both adaptive and innate immune cells just sitting there waiting to respond as soon as something happens within the skin. Now the reason why I'm pointing that out is it helps to highlight how unique the brain is. If you were to stain for most of these cells in the brain, if you were to stain for T cells B cells, natural killer cells, dendritic cells, Langerhans cells, um, macrophages, you wouldn't find any true, you wouldn't find many, or if any, of those immune cells in the brain. Now there's some reports that you'll get a little bit in the cerebral spinal fluid, etc., but you largely won't find most of those, or they'll be at incredibly low levels. And that's where the concept of immune pr privilege comes from. The idea that that immune system isn't really there. Now, all of this started by one, it's got to be one of my favorite scientists out there, Peter Medawa. He won the Nobel Prize for tissue rejection and all sorts of stuff. He's a fantastic immunologist. He's also just a great scientist and a great science communicator. And oh, he's just one of the, one of the really good scientists. Now, I don't know anything about his history or personal life, so I can't re report on him as a quality human being, but he is an amazing scientist. Okay. So he did this uh, experiment where he took these rabbits. This is the 1940s, so you can get away with a bit, okay? So he took these rabbits and he took um, some skin biopsies and then he planted them in different locations of the body to see if they'd be rejected. So for example, he, he attached them to a bit of skin on the chest of the mouse and he also attached it into the brain of the mouse. Now I know that's a bit icky, and so I'm sorry about that, but he put skin into the brain of the mouse. Now, the important thing is, is these are two different rabbits, right? And so they're not matching rabbits as well, genetically, they're not genetically similar rabbits. And so rejection, the organ rejection is expected. The tissue should be recognized by the immune system as other, right? It shouldn't have um, uh, those MHC1 signalings to say that it's the same tissue as your tissue. So your T cells and your natural killer cells should be getting in there and absolutely killing this tissue and rejecting it. And this is what we see. So this is, uh, again, 1940s, not a bad image for a 1940s scientific paper, I'm not going to lie. So this is from the skin of, uh, of the rabbit that's been implanted into the chest skin, right? So it's skin to skin grafting. And what we can see here is these pockets. These pockets are actually cysts and they're actually full of the host's immune system that has now invaded the donor skin tissue and they're now destroying it, right? So the natural killer cells and the cytotoxic T cells are in that piece of skin, ripping it to shreds. So let's have a look at what the skin looked like that was in the brain of the rabbits. <laughs> it's a grim experiment, I'm not gonna lie. But here is the skin from the brain of the rabbit that received the piece of skin. We don't see any cysts. It looks nice and healthy. Um, and so, it hasn't rejected that tissue in the brain. And so Peter Medawa was the first person to say, the brain seems to be immune privileged. He also showed it happened with the back of the eye. Um, and that's not surprising because kind of the, the, the eyes and the brain are the same thing. The brain is just, the eyes are part of the brain when you look at the structures in the brain and all that kind of stuff. So it's not surprising that the eyes had a similar result too. Um, you're putting a piece of skin, and I know this sounds gross, um, you put a piece of skin within the eye and it also didn't get rejected. So he came up with this idea called immune privileged. Um, and yeah, it's it's kind of true. There's this great website called Protein Atlas and it allows you to uh, see where proteins are expressed in the body. So if we look at MHC1, which is that um, self other receptor that all the cells of your body should have that gets surveilled by uh, cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. And if you get recognized as other, those two cells should kill you. Um, 
that all happens through the MHC1 molecule. We can see here that the brain and the eye, this is a little graph on how much MHC1 you would find in the different tissues. We can see that the brain and the eye have almost no MHC1. Um, but there's loads of MHC1 in all the other tissues. Um, which you kind of expect, right? Because your body needs to surveil, is the other, is the self in this location? Has something gone wrong? So the brain and the eye is definitely unique. So this is where the truth to the term immune privilege comes from. Now we can dive in a little bit deeper. Um, here we have a, a section of brain and in yellow we have T cells. And what you can see is there's no yellow, right? So there's no T cells just sitting within that tissue, which is what we would see in uh, skin or other locations in the body. Um, but following a brain injury, now we start to see a few yellow cells uh, uh, spike up. So T cells can get into the brain following an injury, but they're not just sitting there at very high levels. Um, there is some reports at very low levels of T cells within the brain chronically, but uh, it's so low that if you were to ever do an immune histochemistry looking for a T cell in a brain, you're not going to find any. Like, I've just never seen them. I've just never seen them in a healthy brain. Um, and here's another example. So here we have in red microglia and in green yellow we have T cells. And this is the damaged brain. So we can see that the microglia don't look like they're ramified cells of the big trees. They've actually tucked in and become angry and inflamed. And that's what happens when a microglia becomes activated. And so these angry red microglia are there. And we can also see a bunch of yellow T cells in there. Now what they did in this study was they then gave a drug which destroys your microglia. So now you have no microglia, you've got very few microglia. So they give a drug which depletes the microglia from the brain. So here we have a damaged brain plus a drug to remove the microglia. And in yellow we have T cells. So as you can see there's much fewer microglia and there are no yellow T cells. So if you get rid of the microglia, you get rid of the ability of T cells to recruit into the brain in response to tissue damage. And so that actually tells you a little bit of something about what microglia do. So microglia release cytokines and chemokines. Here are some chemokines here, CCL3, CCL4, don't worry about learning that, but chemokines are attractants and these two chemokines attract T cells as well as, well as other cells as well. Um, but these chemokines attract T cells and interferon gamma is a famous adaptive immune cell cytokine activator. So what we can see is in the, in the damaged brain, the microglia are releasing chemokines and cytokines that allow T cells and other immune cells into the brain. So it's not that the brain has no immune system, it just doesn't have this resting presence of a, many of the innate immune cells and all of the adaptive immune cells. So it doesn't have that resting large population within the brain ready to respond. It's got the microglia, and the microglia are sitting there surveying the environment, and if they detect anything, then they can invite in the other immune cells to start um, acting out their um, immune functions. So to expand on the previous video, microglia, they are phagocytes, they eat pathogens, dying cells, and they curate the brain architecture by phagocytosing synapses, for example. They definitely do surveillance, loads of this with pattern recognition receptors and cytokines to regulate the immune response. Um, but they are also the gatekeepers of the cells, and they say, you shall not pass, and then they invite in immune cells into the immune-privileged organ. Um, when uh, when the brain is under attack or getting damaged or injured, um, but is the is it right really to say the brain is immune privileged? And more and more we're learning, it's not great. It's not a great term because it's too absolute. It's kind of saying it's separate from the immune system. We have this thing called the blood blood brain barrier which lines all the blood vessels within our brain that prevents fluid from just leaking out and cells from leaking out from the blood into the brain the stuff that gets into the brain is incredibly tightly controlled and so t cells and b cells and monocytes can't just go wandering in and out of our brain and so that's where the term uh, immune privilege came up from from. But what we're learning, the more and more we look into it, there is actually this very unique and bespoke immune system within the brain. First of all, your brain is um, 
floating in a, a fluid, a cerebral spinal fluid, and there are other immune cells within that cerebral spinal fluid, including T cells. Then your brain is kind of in a bag called the meninges, and just outside that bag, outside those meninges, we find loads of different kinds of immune cells. And what we've recently discovered is that your skull actually contains quite a unique bespoke bone marrow. So when you think of bone marrow, you normally think of your humerus and your femur and a little bit in your tibia. Those are the main immune cell producing bone marrows within your body, but we'll, there are other, other locations. But now we've found that there is an immune cell producing bone marrow in your skull, and it can produce more bespoke adaptive and innate immune cells that infiltrate into the meninges. And so there is this surveillance happening almost just on the outside of the brain waiting to come in and also flowing around the cerebral spinal fluid a little bit. So what we're now learning is that it's not that the brain doesn't have an immune system, it has a very unique and tailored immune system that almost looks so different to the peripheral immune system that we almost didn't recognize it. And so we sort of said that the brain is an immune privilege. There's no immune cells in the brain except for the microglia. Um, but now we're now realizing it's much more complicated. It's just such a unique immune system the brain has. Um, such a unique immune system. And largely people think, you might ask why, why, why have this? And largely people think that the brain is such a sensitive organ, you can't have immune cells going around and just randomly killing one or two cells here and there. Like a misfiring natural killer cell and a misfiring cytotoxic T cell could do so much damage in the brain compared to in the liver. You knock out a few liver cells, they divide and it's fine, right? But we really need to take care of the brain, of the cells in our brain. And so that's largely why they think this unique tailored immune system that's certainly lower and specialized occurs in the brain. And it's true that implants into the brain are must take longer to become rejected um, but I will say that normally in a transplant situation you will induce tissue damage which will cause the microglia to invite in natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells and so any sort of surgical we took a chunk of brain and put it into this brain does result in a rejection process but if we do it subtly say in a fetal or we don't damage it such as laying a piece of skin on the surface of the brain we can avoid some of those rejection processes and it can either not occur or occur very slowly. And that's because of the unique immune system that the brain has. Awesome. Thank you very much for watching that video. Um, up next, we're going to start to talk about what happens during the brain's immune system in disease. And we're going to be focusing on the dementia of Alzheimer's disease.